Hello, everybody. I hope you had a good weekend. Hope everybody's rested, not getting sick with COVID. Uh, this class is going to be for 8 17 20. Okay, August 17, 2020, not 1920. Okay, if you don't remember the name of the school, International. University of the East, okay? Today's topic will be Japan since 1945, the end of World War II. And, uh, I'm just going to be uh, going over the highlights of that time, the hard times that Japan had after the war being so poor in a depression-like state, and then becoming the first successful Eastern uh, country to economize in the modern time and be quite successful and influencing the world with Japanese culture. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Again, it's for 8, 17, 20. And if you needed to know, it's for week six, by the way. So there we are with that. So let me mark down the Starting time and approximately the ending time. We only want to go five minutes, right? And then the class is over. I, I know that's what my students want, so, but I can't do that. Sorry. Okay, so you ready to go to the material? No. Oh, that's too bad. Here we go. Okay, so HIS 103, which is history, 103, Asian history. Oh, week seven. We're going faster than I thought. Okay, so again, I'm going to get my face out of the way. We need to learn about Asian history. We don't need to look at me. Maybe I'll bring some uh, handsome guys to class next time for you. Okay. All right, ready to start. Japan since 1945. The post war Allied occupation. And if you don't remember who the Allies were, it was the United States, originally United States, France, and England. Later at the end, when uh, the Soviet Union reversed their position because they were invaded by Nazi Germany, then the, Russia became part of the Allies. The Showa Emperor's surrender speech was broadcast over the radio airwaves on August 15th, 1945. And on August 28th, a few days before the formal surrender ceremonies were conducted aboard the battleship Missouri on September 2nd, the first small advance party of what would eventually become an Allied occupation force reaching up to a quarter million persons, a lot, touched down in a C-47 transport plane At an airport outside Tokyo. Not important, the C 47 transport plane. 40 million persons, maybe. The first Allied arrivals were uncertain what sort of reception they might encounter. They even thought at the time the Japanese might attack them. They still had hidden soldiers. But they were not sure. The Japanese, too, were anxious and uncertain what sort of behavior to expect from the arriving foreign army of occupation, whose soldiers had until recently been such bitter enemies. 
Many Japanese were relieved that the war was finally over, but many were also understandably apprehensive. So apprehensive means unsure, nervous. With relatively few exceptions, however, the arriving allied forces were treated with respect and even privilege. That is until 1951. For example, the Japanese government provided move this page, authorities with free servants, whereas the occupation authorities, for their part, behaved with marked magnanimity toward their defeated foe, uh, which means like most of all, I mean, there might have been some stupid low-level soldiers that said bad things, but most of the high-ranking people uh, treated the Japanese with respect. Not a few participants in the occupation discovered a lifelong love and fascination for Japanese culture. It sounds a little confusing in its structure. What it means is not a few actually means quite a lot of people, foreign people, American people that uh, participated in the occupation. They discovered this lifelong love and fascination for Japanese culture. I had it too at one time. In retrospect, the usual verdict is that the post-war Allied occupation of Japan was an overall great success. Although it is conventionally referred to as an Allied occupation, it was overwhelmingly an American affair. So we're gonna break it down here. Unlike post-war Germany and Korea, defeated Japan was not divided into separate zones of occupation by the different allied powers. A multinational Far Eastern Commission was eventually established in Washington, D.C. and the Four Power Allied Council for Japan was sent to Tokyo, which included British, Chinese, and Soviet representatives but a single unified supreme commander for the Allied Powers, SCAP, was appointed for the entire region. The officer assigned this command was the senior American general, Douglas MacArthur, born 1880, died 1964, who set up his headquarters in the Daiichi building in Tokyo at the end of August 1945. Did you know Daiichi was around at that time? Most of the occupation personnel were also American. President Truman initially instructed General MacArthur, and that brings us to the end of the first page. So you know what I have to do there. It's time to write, folks. So here we go. First question. And on that first page, I'm only going to give you one. Again, I'm getting into that thing of being too kind. I have to get tough. But some students cry. Oh, so tough. Can't handle it. So my one and only question for this page, 
who was assigned command to the Japanese occupation in 1945? Who was it? Was it Ronald McDonald? Was it KFC Haraboji? Or was it uh, Donald Trump? Who was assigned uh, command to the Japanese occupation? So go ahead and try to answer that. Let me make my markings. Okay, make those markings. For uh, Lishwan, this would be 277 in the book, which I know you have. And I know you're not sharing with Wani unless she pays the uh, $100. I know. Okay. So you got that? All right, so only one question. Thank you. Uh, Tammy, who's Tammy? Tamujen, we're not uh, taking the eraser. So here's the eraser, repeating one before I erase it. Who was assigned command to the Japanese occupation in 1945? Was it KFC Haraboji, Ronald McDonald, Donald Trump, or I'll throw in a wild card number four. It could have been Draymond. There we go. So now back to that delicious reading. Okay, so you can see we stopped down here at we're also American. Well, actually, I read the next sentence, but it's part of the next page. So I'll reread it. President Truman initially instructed, and that's who the president was at the time. General MacArthur, okay. that inside defeated Japan, this is to MacArthur, your authority is supreme, so no one's higher than you in Japan, even the emperor, okay, because they were occupied. And MacArthur envisioned or thought about his role, so his own role in Japan, as nothing less than a Sovereign. A couple of ways to translate sovereign. Person looking over, some people on the negative side might say king, but I don't think he took it to that extent. MacArthur took a grandly imperious view of his position as a kind of military proconsul presiding over post-war Japan, so remember pro-council, not negative. And he was fond or liked claiming that he had had some special understanding of the Oriental mind. So uh, Oriental was a term used for old Asian countries at the time. Asian was not invented until later, until more recently. So you'd even see on maps the Orient. And there are some places you can see there's one on Melrose and Beverly Hills and they sell oriental furniture. So there was nothing negative about it. It's just that uh, some young Asian people said, well, I don't like the term. Uh, I'm not furniture. Or I'm not an oriental rug. So I prefer the term Asian. But rest be assured, there was nothing disrespectful. It was the Far East. It was the Orient. So if you're confused, that's the reason why. So based presumably in his early years of living in the Philippines, okay? Well, that's an Asian country, but it's different than Japan. Actually, the Southeast Asian and largely Catholic Filipinos, see, you'll see right here, are quite different from the East Asian Japanese. And MacArthur had very little familiarity with Japan. Oopsie. Nevertheless, MacArthur's paternalistic or father-like attitude did not generate some well, or did generate some well-intentioned efforts 
to benefit the Japanese people. It is said that he had a fondness for the Japanese people. This was crucial because initially, amid or around the desolation, or you could say destruction of Japan's bombed out cities, there were desperate shortages of almost everything. Food was rationed, but the rations were less than the minimal, normal nutritional requirements necessary to sustain life or to keep life going. That's what that means. Nearly every, everyone was forced, therefore, to turn to illegal black markets just to get enough food to survive. Black marketeering was so pervasive that one magazine observed with dark humor in 1948 that the only people who are not living illegally are those in jail. So I wonder if my young Japanese students, if I was in class with you, I would ask you, who do you think mostly set up these illegal black markets? Do you have an idea? It was the Yakuza. This is how the Yakuza started building their power in a more modern style Japan. So people came to them and paid ridiculous amounts of money for food, protection, clothes, you name it. Uh, MacArthur, however, responded quickly to the emergency by requesting relief supplies of food and medicine, which undoubtedly saved many lives, even though it could not begin to eliminate the hardships of the early post-war years. MacArthur also seems to have felt some sympathy for the Japanese emperor. And that was a touchy issue, as you will see. Very, very touchy. At the time of Japan's surrender, American opinion was seriously divided over the question of how thoroughly Japan would have to be forcibly reconstructed so that it would no longer be a threat to world peace. Some felt that the old militaristic Japan would have to be almost completely obliterated, or it's another word for destroyed. And a great many of the allies felt that Japan should quite properly be punished for its wartime aggression. And yes, they were very aggressive uh, with what they did in Southeast Asia and East Asia. Initially, plans were drawn up to dismantle or separate Japan's remaining industrial plants and ship them abroad as war reparations. And reparations are when you pay someone or a group of people for the bad things that you did to them in the past. All of Japan's overseas colonial possessions, including Korea, Taiwan, and Manchuria, which Japan changed to Manchukuo, uh, which had not technically been a colony, Manchuria, but had been effectively dominated by the Japanese. That's where they put, if my Chinese students remember, Puyi, as a person in charge of Manchukuo were liberated and some six and a half million Japanese people returned from overseas to home islands. This is something that I didn't know when I was younger, that even though, let's say, Japan lost the war at the end of 1945, there were a lot of Japanese people living in Korea, Taiwan, much ago. They either wanted to or were forced to come home. I found that even in the Philippines, the same thing where they were just told, you're gonna to have to leave. So, wow. Okay, so we're at the bottom of the next page. War crime trials also soon began. 
intended, intended to punish specific alleged culprits. Culprits mean the criminals, people who are guilty of doing something. And alleged in the Western court of law, you're always alleged to have do, done something. And then it's up to the court and the lawyers to prove that you did, which is different than like, let's say South America and Mexico, where the police decide right away if you're guilty or not. So if they decide that you're guilty, your lawyer in court has to prove that you were innocent, which is the opposite. 28 class A prisoners were charged with major crimes against peace. Not like Tembo Jenehoni has crimes against lattes at the Starbucks. And they were tried by the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. Seven of these were convicted and sentenced to death by hanging. That's where they put the rope around your head. Drop open the floor below you and your body hangs through, which was the same done to the Nazis and the uh, uh, tribunal they had in Europe, their Nuremberg the city. In addition, not counting those captured by the Soviet Union and Chinese communists. Oh, that probably would have went worse. Uh, why, why do I say that? Uh, put it this way. The Germans that were somehow still surviving in Berlin towards the very end of the war and the Soviets had entered the city, uh, for example, all of Hitler's generals and what have you, they were really hoping to get arrested and captured by the Americans because the Americans were gonna be fair for them and give them a trial and food. And they were very afraid of the Soviet Union. They thought for sure they were gonna be tortured and slaughtered. So that's why I'm saying that. Some 5,700 other Japanese were tried by allied international military tribunals most of whom were accused of class C or conventional war crimes, such as mistreatment of prisoners. Of these, 4,405 were convicted or found guilty, and 984 were executed or killed by the government. Beyond the punishment of Pacific war crimes specific during the first three years of the occupation. More than 200,000 former military officers, politicians, and leaders were also purged by the occupation authorities. So what you should learn from that is uh, these folks, the military officers, politicians, and business leaders were still in one way or another causing problems uh, in Japan at the time. And just being purged means they got rid of it. Doesn't mean that they killed them. Maybe they put them in prison, you know? So I'm at the bottom of the next page for must be question time. And hopefully we have more questions than we did on the first page, right? Board. There we go, let me get that pencil. Bird AV, why do you send me so many assignments? You just send me the ones, one each week. I don't know what's going on there. So don't take my eraser. Here we go.
Okay, question two. After the war, the Japanese people were so poor that they had to turn to what to survive? What did they have to turn to? Now, I don't mean, and like I said, you might get a funny student like James Hong and said, did they turn to the left or did they turn to the right or did they fall down? So no, it means they had to turn to do something or to someone to change their situation. That's what I'm trying to say here. Okay, so because I had to explain it again, I think I should charge $20, you know, so I can buy some more uh, uh, teriyaki at my favorite restaurant in Little Tokyo. And I bet none of you know the name of my favorite restaurant in Little Tokyo. None of you. Okay, back to the pencil. You know, I'm only going to ask you two questions here. I must be getting slow. I must make you suffer, right? But no, I'm getting weak because, you know, Inky's a sensitive gal. So. And don't forget Paul or Mahu sensitivity with a little violence. Doki. Three. Oh, I put Y, so let me fix this. So I was thinking about my teriyaki. Okay. Uh, what happened to Japan's overseas colonies of Korea, Taiwan, and Manchuria? What happened to those places? Did they disappear off the face of the earth? What, what happened to them? Are they still around? What's going on there? Those are the only two questions I have for this page. Let me make my markings that I asked these questions. And again, my student that's tracking this, the shrunk, that would be 278. Okay. I don't think I have my socket tonight like I did last week. It's too bad. I'll check your socket. It helps me sleep. Ah, myself. Okay. So did you guys, like I said, just write these down. You can write the answer later. You can go over the tape as many times as you want. That's another reason why I took my face off the corner. So if you have to see it a few times, you'll say, oh my God, there's a teacher again. Looks like he's making trouble. Okay, so let me get that eraser. Okay, two. Repeating, after the war, the Japanese people were so poor that they had to turn to what to survive. If you want to say left, that's okay. If you want to say right, that's okay. If you want to say backflip, that's not okay. Uh, so that's done. Three, what happened to Japan's overseas colonies of Korea, Taiwan, and Manchuria? Did they move to the United States? Uh, did uh, Korea move to K-Town in LA and Taiwan to Monterey Park? And then 
Manchuria moved to Alhambra. Rosemi, we were not sure. So I'm done with these. And back to the reading material. As you see, we stop right here at occupation authorities. Okay. And now we're going to continue. Let me see, because I have to jump pages here. Okay. So just up here, Wani, just so that, I mean, not Wani, because Nishwan's not sharing with you. Just to let you know, this will be the top of uh, two, 283. Okay. All right. So e economic recovery and the... developmental state. For many people in Japan, the first winter after the end of World War II was the hardest. As a result of wartime firebombing, millions of persons were homeless and obliged to sleep well, I just kind of like made to because of the circumstance. Sleep in subway stations or whatever other improvised shelter they could find. Industrial production stood at a fraction of its pre-war levels. So what it means is it really went down their industrial production. And some 5 million Japanese were unemployed. Japan recovered only very slowly from this devastation. Recovery had scarcely even begun by the end of the occupation. So it had barely begun even when the United States left the scene and felt Japan could stand on its own. Real per capita gross national product, GNP in Japan, did not regain its pre-World War II level until 1953. So what GNP? What is that? Is that CPK, California Pizza Kitchen? What is GNP? So the real per capita gross national product. So that's the amount of money the whole country makes with all the different things. So it did not regain its pre-World War II level until 1953 for eight more years. The difficulty of Japan's economic recovery was, and now we're gonna find out reasons why, compounded or added onto by the almost complete lack of industrial raw materials in the home islands. And if you've done your studies before, that's a big reason why Japan, uh, aside from nationalistic reasons of being the land of the rising sun, and they wanted to unite all of Asia under Japanese rule, they really needed raw materials that they were not able to make since it's an island nation. So different countries uh, like Malaysia, what have you, were able to give Japan the materials and that's why they also invaded them and started using their products for the wartime effort. So now without all that, Again, they're back to almost no raw materials in Japan. The outbreak of the Korean War in 1950, during the fighting of which United Nations forces used Japan for invaluable forward bases, so very close to Korea, be based there and then go on over to Korea, sparked a minor boom in the Japanese economy but it would not be until the end of the 50s that the Japanese economy really took 
off. Okay? And what that means took off is became a success. Okay? That's what I'm talking about. From 1955, we're in the middle of uh, 283. From 1955 until 1973, then the average annual growth in Japan's GNP exceeded 10%. It was growing Good for Japan. In two decades, from 1950 to 1970, Japan's GNP multiplied some 20 times. By 1968, Japan had passed West Germany to become the world's third largest economy. Wow, that's really impressive. We need some handshakes there and some clapping. Maybe Mrs. Magawa's family was involved in that big success story. At the same time, the industrial sector of Japan's economy finally became one of the most developed on earth. Wow, the successes keep on coming. In the 1950s for consumers in America, the label made in Japan had still been synonymous with cheap or cheaply made. But Japan moved swiftly from its initial base in textiles and other light industries to more advanced consumer electronics. The transistor, for example, was invented by Bell Laboratories in 1948. And during the 1950s, Japan's Sony Corporation adapted this new technology to create a whole new generation of lightweight portable radios. Yes, I remember the transistor radio. even though I was only an infant. As a result, uh, Japan soon dominated the world market for transistor radios. Not content or satisfied with stopping there, Japanese corporations moved on uh, to become major producers of ever larger and more sophisticated products. The first Japanese Toyota Toyopet, I bet none of you guys ever saw it, but neither did I, it's before my time too. Toyopet automobiles were unloaded in the United States in 1957. What is a Toyopet? Uh, by 1981, Japan had become the world's largest automaker. Oh, oh. And an authentic, global economic super power. Okay. Here it says his figure 10-1. The Toyota Toyopet shown arriving in San Francisco in 1957 was Japan's first export automobile. I think when I was an infant, Japan started importing Mazdas, and what was the name of the, it had a special engine that ran on a belt around, yeah, this is very different. I know Korean cars, then. sorry, they didn't make cars in Korea at the time. Uh, one reason for Japan's remarkable post-war, which means after the war, Economic success may have been the total devastation of the war itself, which provided a clean slate from which to begin with. The latest technologies and newest facilities obtained through generous, though not free, agreements for technology transfer from the United States and to other developed countries. The transistor radio is one such classic example of technology transfer. Japan also enjoyed the immense, which is huge, advantage of relatively 
unrestricted export access to the U.S. was helping them to the huge American consumer market, although Japan was hardly alone in that position. But Japan also had the benefit of well-trained and experienced human capital surviving from the war. And much of the credit for Japan's success is certainly due simply to the hard work and determination of the Japanese people. And I'd like to say the same for my students. Their success is due simply to the hard work and determination of their study. Because I know none of my students cheat, right? None of you guys, you're all just 10 hours a day studying that stuff, right? I believe you. Okay, so that means we're at the bottom of 283. So it's time to hit that whiteboard. So hopefully I ask more than two questions this time. Maybe I should ask 12, that would be nice, right? Juan, he wants me to ask 12 questions. She told me, teacher, you don't ask enough questions. Okay, question is one on page 283. What compounded Japan's economic recovery? And uh, what that means is what made the situation even more difficult than what it was just being that they lost the war? What else made it hard for them to recover economically? And we mentioned that a couple of times. Oops, Joans, it should be Japan's. Okay. Oh, here goes I must. Five. When did Japan's economy finally take off? So I might have a funny guy in the class say, you mean take off like it's a plane? Uh, no, that's not what that means. It's a metaphor for when did the economy finally get successful, start making Japan a lot of money. So I'll give you a few minutes to write those down. Do my thing over here. Oops, I got one more. Oh, I'm not being kind here. I got one more question. He he. Gonna have to be strong, students. I know. Three. That was a long page. So the last question for this page, 283. Uh, from 1950 through 1970, 
what happened to Japan's GNP? If you remember, I explained that that's the gross national product and that's the total of all the Japanese business, what kind of profit did they do? So what do you think? Use a little common sense here. 1950, it was terrible. So do you think that in 1970, it was still terrible? Okay, you can think about that for a while. Maybe ask Alex or Ken what the answer might be. So go ahead, again, let me do my thing. All right, let me go hit that eraser. So one, what compounded Japanese or Japan's economic recovery? I think I have an answer which again, what made it worse? Gojira. Gojira, or in America we say Godzilla. I think that's what made it more difficult to recover. And that's before Gojira even had Ninja. So uh, that's my guess. Okay, five, when did Japan's economy finally take off? And again, that has nothing to do with planes. So when did it take off? Uh, 1974, 64 Olympics, when they hosted the Tokyo Games. Who knows? Does anybody know in the 1964 Tokyo Games, any time a country hosts an Olympics, they get to introduce a new sport. So does anybody know what sport Japan introduced in 1964? No, it was judo. They introduced uh, judo. Okay, not. I've had some American students say, uh, "In the Olympics, 1964, uh, Japan introduced sudoku." No, that is not an Olympic sport. Poor little guy, Jane doesn't know what's going on. Okay, five is gone then. Six, 1950 to 1970, what happened to Japan's GNC? And again, this has nothing to do with CPK or for my Korean students, BCD, Jungdong. Which by the way, my Korean students should say a prayer for the nice lady who was the owner of all the Jungdongs who just passed away from cancer this last uh, week and a half. So you should say a prayer for that lady. Remember I told you guys, life is short. Don't be cruel to people, be kind to people because you never know when it's your time to go, right? So again, try to be kind to folks, okay? It's better that way. All right, six is gone. Back to the delicious reading material. So you see, I ended here at the Japanese people. And again, we're gonna do a switcheroo to interesting page. So I'm gonna jump, uh, Lishwan, we would be on 289, okay? 289 where it says Japan and globalization. That's where we'll be. Okay. Oopsie. Gotta be very careful anytime I touch something. Okay, I'll start reading. Uh, Japan and globalization. Uh, despite the end of dramatic economic growth rates, and yes, they were dramatic, Japan today is still a prosperous, highly developed, thoroughly modern society, in many ways, a very attractive place to get to live. 
So who's my only Japanese student here? Missing Nagawa. Is it an attractive place to live? I, I, I lived there, but it was a very short time. Again, when I was in Shrimp Town, uh, Ebina, Nagawa. So, but I know Miss Nagawa has lived there longer. So I, I thought it was an attractive place to live. But, um, you know, what can I say? I'm just a gaijin. Unrestrained economic development in the early post-war years had incurred or made costs or downsides of it its own, such as making Japan one of the most heavily uh, polluted countries on earth. All those unregulated factories at the time. A growing awareness <laughs> of the dangers of pollution and civic activism brought new controls and regulations in the 1970s and the beginning of environmental improvements. That's very good. Some relaxation of the intense pressure for constant economic growth since the 1990s may also make it easier simply to enjoy life a little, and I would say, the more izakayas, the more you can enjoy life. We need, we need more izakayas. We're in the middle of the page. Unlike as recently as the end of World War II, Japan is now an overwhelmingly urban society or city society with roughly 80% of the Japanese people living in cities. Originally, there was a lot of farmers in Japan. Korea was the same. I knew this older guy that he was in the Vietnam War, and I guess still in the 60s, he took a vacation into Seoul and uh, we got off the airport. We got off the plane in the airport. I didn't say what it was, Kim Paul. I'm not sure. But there was so much farming and so much farming of kimchi in the area that he said, just getting off the plane on a hot summer day in Seoul, you could just smell the kimchi in the air. It was uh, everywhere. So again, 80% of the Japanese people living in cities. These Japanese cities are generally, generally very pleasant places too. Among them, Tokyo may have already been the largest city in the world by the 18th century. And if it perhaps has more recently been surpassed in size by Mexico, yes, that's true, and Mexico has worst smog and pollution than Tokyo ever had. How do, I not, how do I know? I'll tell you two instances where I was in Mexico City. First of all, they have so much smog, the cars have certain stickers on them, a red and a green sticker. And you are not allowed to drive your cars on certain days. So let's say if I lived in Mexico City, I have a red sticker. Um, I can drive my car Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, but not Tuesday, Thursday, or Saturday. And the person that has the green ticket is the reverse. That's to fight the smog. And when I was, I stayed in Mexico City one time, eight days in Mexico City at a hotel. I was doing my usual spy work. And after a couple of days, one day I blew my nose into a tissue. And usually, like here, if I blow my nose into something, okay, don't get upset, all my doctor students, but what goes in the tissue is either green, yellow, or clear. But in Mexico City, what I blew after three or four days was all black. Okay. So that's how much pollution they have in Mexico City. And that didn't happen to me in Japan, and I stayed much longer than eight days. It is still a vast metropolis that is home to some 30 million. Apart from a few scattered clusters of <laughs> excuse me, skyscrapers, however, 
The Tokyo skyline is relatively unremarkable and undistinguished. The city has been described as resembling a seemingly endless series of urban villages, each centering around a shopping arcade and connected by a remarkably efficient network of subway lines. That's true, it's very effective. I, here in the United States, the bus and the metro is always late. Japan is never late. I don't know how they do it. Even though I was so confused in the Tokyo station with the machine taking my ticket, going through a turnstile and spitting it out at the end and then not coming out at the other end, I, I was so confused. Red line, green line, hygiene line, I didn't know what was going on. Um, so thanks to the American fire bombing, in 1945 and relentless construction, it is almost entirely new, okay? And that brings us to the bottom of 289. So that means we have to go back to the whiteboard for some more questions. Like I said, some students have complained. They want more and more questions, at least 40 questions each week. So maybe I should try doing that this week. I'll start this week with 40 questions, right? <laughs> okay. Get the pencil. Hang in there, tall. I know you're missing <sighs> Tamil. So question seven, Japan is now what kind of society? Is it a samurai society? A geisha society? You know, I dated a geisha for a short time. It's a secret, I can't tell you. Uh, anyway, that was one of my disappointments when I very first went to Japan in 1989. I was looking for samurai in Tokyo and I could not find any samurai. So maybe I've just given away the answer to seven. Okay, so what Japan is now what kind of society? The next one. Only two on this page, I must be slipping. Okay, eight. What percent of the people live in Japan's cities? Is that a low percent? 10%? Let me stretch that out for you. So, what percent of the people live in Japan's cities? Maybe it's a high percent. If you're paying attention to the lecture, you'll know the answer immediately. Maybe everybody moved to Okinawa. Who knows? Okay, so let me give you a minute or two to write those down. Do what I got to do. Okay, Wani, that means, I mean, I'm sorry, Wani. You, you didn't pay your fee to me, Schwan. Uh, we'll be finishing with the 289. Okay.
Okay. Okay, is it cool for me to go <coughs> get the eraser? No, what if he says no? Bernie, I can't get the eraser? Okay, Anglican says I can do it. She says you gotta shut up. Okay, so I'll go to get it. Okay, seven, again, Japan is now what kind of society? Some of my Japanese students will say, it depends where you live, teacher. If you're talking about Harajuku, it is a cosplay. And I've been to Harajuku, and I think you're right with all the sailor moons that I saw there and other strange kind of kabuki kind of young guys. So, seven is done. Eight, what percent of the people live in Japan cities? So usually guys like uh, Timu and uh, Ken and Mr. Hong, they love these questions. They just have to give a number or a percent. They don't have to write a sentence, so they're very happy. So I did this for you guys. Well, I love you. Not too much, but enough. Okay, that's gone. So let's move on. So again, we end it here. It is almost entirely new. Those at police, helicopter looking for Pamela Titan. She's gotta stop stealing cars, her and Caroline. Caroline's usually the driver. Okay. So again, like I was saying, it is almost entirely new. So we got to switch over. And again, I have to jump because I want to take you to the interesting stuff, not the boring uh, pages. So I'm going to jump to uh, 292. All right. And look at this. Wani and Li Xuan, hometown, Taipei, the capital of Taiwan. The place where I land my plane and just buy a bowl by and then get back on the plane and come back to the United States. It's more convenient for me to fly to Taipei than drive to Andre Park. So in Taipei, the capital of Taiwan, the first major skyscraper ever constructed was the Mitsugoshi building. Japanese department store. Has anybody ever shopped in the Mitsukoshi building? Maybe one year or Lishwa. Although it has since been eclipsed or taken over by the newer Taipei 101, I bet uh, one year and Lishwa have been to Taipei 101. I have a feeling. which for years in the early 21st century was the tallest skyscraper on the planet. Wow. Mitsukoshi building still towers over the skyline of the old Taipei city center, but it's not the tallest anymore. Japanese cultural influences, and that's what we're starting to talk about here, on Taiwan began to surge, especially in the 1980s. Do any of you guys remember the 1980s? I bet most of you were not born yet. You know, I was born in 79, so I remember the 80s a little bit. By mid-decade, <laughs> excuse me, Japanese language publications in Taiwan were outselling those written in English. And despite a continuing official ban or limit on Japanese songs and movies, 31% of all Taiwan's video rentals were Japanese productions. Wow, so popular. 
one 21st century Taipei restaurant advertises authentic Japanese style curry or kare. Curry originated as an Indian style dish that was much popularized by the British. <laughs> Excuse me, as he must say. Oh. And in prepackaged form, it became a staple, just like rice is the staple of Asian countries, of the modern Japanese diet. Widely available in coffee shops and inexpensive Japanese restaurants. My favorite is Biguri Donkey in Tokyo and Chiba. That's where I like to go when I go there. I get my curry steak or Hamburg curry steak. So, Like the Japanese style curry that was being marketed in Taipei, a similar process of hybridization is actually at the core of much cultural globalization. So I have one question in this area. So let me get to it. Oh, we also have here the Taipei 101 in Taiwan. Wow. I think I climbed it one time. It was the tallest skyscraper in the world from 2003 to 2009. Then the Wanishuan building was constructed and is the tallest building in Taiwan. Okay, whiteboard for the one question, pencil. So be question nine. Easy questions, right? Nothing too difficult. Don't stretch the mind that much. So the one question for this small page, nine, in Taipei, Taiwan, the first major skyscraper constructed was what? I would say that was the Boba building. That was the first major skyscraper in Taiwan, the Boba building. And they have a black Boba ball on top of the building or skyscraper. Okay, so <clears throat> write that down. Let me mark that off. Okay, so that would actually be, I, I took it over a bit there. Let's say we're both, uh, it's a 292 with a little addition of 293, a mere snippet, as you say. Let me get the eraser. Again, in Taipei, Taiwan, the first major skyscraper constructed was what? I say the Boba building, some Students have said in the past the KFC Tower or the Jackie Chan skyscraper. Who I think Olar Ma dated Jackie Chan for a couple of years, but he wouldn't marry her. So sorry about that. Okay, ready? Let me erase this one. Okay, that one's gone. Now let's jump on over. Again, if you didn't see it, here it is. 
on the top. And I climbed all the way to the top and stood up here. And then I jumped down with an umbrella. And I landed pretty safely. <laughs> so Wani and Nishwan, you have to send me an email with your homework and say, yes, I went to the Taipei 101 building, or no, I didn't because my third husband would not allow me to go up there. I want to know, I'm curious uh, if you went up there or not. And I don't think you've been in the Mitsubishi, but who knows? Okay, where's that arrow? Okay, just checking for checking space. Oh, wow. We got more, baby. Baby Bubba. Okay, good deal. So let me go back. Oopsie. Let me see. I didn't want to do that. That's not working. Okay, we'll get that out of the way. Oh, there I am. You don't want to see me. So just go through this again. Okay, so here we were. We finished that, so we have to go to the next one. Okay. Many modern Japanese products were arguably in some sense originally Western ideas, and that's true including everything from automobiles to transistors, pop music videos and cartoons that now merely happen to be <coughs> manufactured in Japan. This might simply be taken as further evidence of the westernization of Japan, except that these things are often given a Japanese twist in the process and sometimes then even return to influence the West. The Japanese word anime, pronounced anime, for example, comes from the English animation, or what the kids know as cartoons. But not, this nicely illustrates the often complex cross currents, so currents going different ways, of cultural globalization. Judo was, of course, originally a Japanese martial art. And even today, even as practiced in the United States, it still usually involves a certain amount of Japanese-style clothing, ritual, and Japanese language vocabulary. Osotogari, Bayotoshi, right? Yet it was, from the start, a modern hybrid. Well, we know what a hybrid is two things put together, like our hybrid cars now. They run a little on gas and a little on electricity. It was invented in the 1880s. It doesn't say here, but I know it was Chigoro Kano who invented judo. Based on older styles of weaponless combat by Japan's first member of the International Olympic Committee. Didn't I talk about that earlier? It may have been inspired in part by the ancient Chinese Taoist philosophy of yielding, using the soft to conquer the hard. I have not found that to be the case in my life. Hard is hard, they don't get soft. But it was also inspired by modern European ideas concerning sport and the importance of physical exercise. With its acceptance as an Olympic sport in 1960, that's the acceptance, but it wasn't played until the 64 Olympics. Judo became increasingly international. By the end of the 20th century, there was more judo practitioners in Europe than in Japan. Europeans were competing for the majority of A-level titles and the official languages of the International Judo Federation were English and French, not Japanese. The British colony of Hong Kong, 
located on the coast of China, experience an invasion of modern Japanese pop music during the 1980s. This music included both the original Japanese language versions and the local Cantonese. Uh, language covers of Japanese songs. At one point in 1989, for example, there were four different roughly simultaneous Hong Kong covers of the same Japanese song. Did you guys know that? Probably not. In the 1990s, this Japanese boom was followed by something of a counter reaction and an assertion of native Hong Kong musical talent. Cantonese covers of Japanese songs became less common in the 1990s, although original Japanese music remained popular. Most recently though, a hybridization of pop music seems to be the trend. As one final illustration of the complicated patterns in which global and local, traditional and new intertwine or mix in the formation of modern pop culture, something called Enka style music. I might have to ask Missy Nagawa, what is Enka? Often considered to be the very embodiment of the native popular as opposed to the elite, so the common people, Japanese music traditions. Yet Enka actually combines Western instruments with Japanese scales and techniques. And although the word Enka can be traced as far back as the 1880s, the familiar Enka style did not really emerge until the 1920s or even later. So none of us were around at that time. Despite its popular association with the soul of the Japanese, moreover, such non-Japanese artists as Teresa Tang, Tang Li Jun, 1953-95, have also been described as Enka singers. Teresa Tang frequently recorded in Japanese, but more commonly in her native Mandarin Chinese. Teresa noticed also the borrowed Western language first name was a mainlander Chinese, kind of like a Beijinger, born and raised on Taiwan. Oh, sorry, Taiwan. Whose clear, sweet voice and numerous hit tunes played a role that cannot be underestimated in reintroducing modern Western style commercial pop music to the mainland People's Republic of China as it began to emerge from the Maoist isolationism after 1978. She remains even after her tragic premature death from asthma in 1995, one of the most beloved pop singers in the entire Chinese speaking world. Somehow she managed to simultaneously combined a singer from Taiwan who was quintessentially Chinese with also being both Western style and Japanese style. So Japanese culture and food scene again. The world increasingly interprets or interpretates globalization, operates across national borders, which however still remain important and complex swirling patterns. Japan, which has been called the first non-Western society on earth to successfully modernize, remains perhaps overall the most successful. Yay for Japan. Yet, although it is difficult to define or explain precisely what this means, Japan somehow also remains uniquely Japanese. Okay, so out of all that mishmash, I will only ask you a question or questions that are important. I won't really ask about the singer. It's hard to remember. That pencil. So this will be 10.
So 10, name some worldwide Japanese cultural items mentioned in the reading. And I think they mentioned three or four. <clears throat> so please write those down. Try to stretch this out. There we go. So again, name some worldwide Japanese cultural items mentioned in the reading. So again, just like the test, if you write down one and someone writes down three, you know who's going to get more points. Okay. And last question for the day. Yay! Under twelve questions. I know. Wani wanted forty, but maybe next week. So the last question for today, Japan has been called the what in modern times? Okay, with the stretching. Oh, stretch those legs. Okay. So again, I don't want any of my funny students, they're usually guys, not tall, tall is so serious. Uh, but they might say something like, Japan has been called the what in modern times? And they'll say, they'll write down, it's been called Japan. That's not funny. What did it say in the reading that gave an amount of respect to Japan? So write those down. Let me mark down that I've asked you the final questions for this week. Okay. And the final page, which would be 294. 294. Okay, Bernie, you ready to go home? No? You want to stay one more hour? I can read more if you want. Just let me get some more of this uh, socket. Oh, come by. Okay, get in the eraser. 10, name some worldwide Japanese cultural items mentioned in the reading. I think one was uh, Okura. The other one was... Uh, Ika, and then it was uh, Hokkaido Street. Okay. Come on. Eleven. Japan has been called what in modern times? Please don't say Japan. Okay. So that's it for this week. I hope everybody enjoyed it. We got through. Take care of yourself. Put your masks on. Do your social distancing. Try not to get sick. So uh, just be good. I hope everybody uh, stays healthy. All right? All right. Uh, see you guys next week. Bye-bye.